is your secret to this youth? You have this fountain of youth. What is it for you? Damn, I love playing. I'm Allison Hagendorf. America, this is the next. Hello, Times Square. Hello, Madison Square Garden. Welcome to X Games Aspen. I'm Allison Hagendorf. I'm the live announcer of the BMA. Welcome to Rock This with Allison Hagendorf. Yeah, this is Allison Hagendorf. Allison Hagendorf. My girl. Allison Hagendorf. I am first and foremost a music fan. He may very well be the most important person in rock and roll. You're on the Allison Hagendorf show. We're going to go dive deep. You're the connection to yeah, the musician's heart. And she rocks. My name is Allison Hagendorf. And you're on the Mike Shinoda show. You get nervous. Sometimes you're a, a nervous Nelly. Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> Excellent. You're very good at this, Allison. Thank you. Yo, baby. I want to put him on my album cover. You're like, I'm on the way. The template for how you go I to a rock it. show. Damiano David, it might be the first time you hear my name. Well, Allison, one really funny thing that I, I wanted to mention. We don't do this. Yeah. Only, literally only with you. You are first sharing that with I know, I played you some of the songs. Together in 1983 as a band. She's fit, like she's a badass all around. What you did for my whole life career. You made me feel so seen. I'm being like really vulnerable right now. This feels like a therapy session. This has gotten very self-revelatory. <laughs> Hello, my fellow music lovers, and welcome to the Allison Hitchcock Show. Hello, my fellow music lovers, and welcome to the Allison Hagendorf Show. This is where we celebrate the universal love of music and the rock and roll spirit that lives in each of us. I'm so glad you're here. We are here at DWP Studios, and I want to give a shout out to our presenting sponsor, Cloudwater, and our friends and partners at Sweetgrass Vodka and Karma Sauce as well, who all fuel my life and help make this show possible along with you. Your support means the world to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The legendary Niall Rogers is here with us today. I hope you know that these special moments never get lost in me. I am so very grateful. I had the opportunity to chat with him backstage at Bottle Rock last year, and I knew I just had to create another opportunity to dive deep with him and hear his stories. In addition to being one of the most incredible composers, musicians, and artists, he's just so cool and humble. He's a good human being. As Niall has said, the best thing my parents taught me was to be kind to everybody. My mother always said, it's just as easy to smile as it is to frown, and it's just as easy to be nice as it is to be mean. So why not choose to be nice? His advice from his mother truly resonates with me as I was raised the exact same way. It's about making random human connections, asking the cashier how their day is, smiling at a stranger in an elevator instead of looking down at your phone, saying good morning to someone passing by. Those little exchanges make my day. They make me feel good about the world. My husband Brian laughs at me because I literally do this to everyone I come in contact with. And many times my greeting is not reciprocated, which is fine because guess what? Those people don't owe me anything. I just feel like if I can put a little bit of love and light into the universe and make someone smile or warm their heart just a little bit, that positive energy will radiate, and that is my mission. Being a good human often seems rare these days, but the more I find and talk to the great ones like Niall, the more I realize there are more of us than we think. We just have to amplify and celebrate heart, love, and light, and that's what I hope to do here with you. I see you, and I appreciate you. Okay, coming up after this short break, we have the hit maker himself, the one and only living legend, Niall Rogers, in studio, sharing stories you haven't heard before, and much, much more. Stay tuned. My guest today is the co-founder of the era-defining funk group, Chic. His music sparked the advent of hip-hop with good times and rapper's delight. His creative genius helped shape iconic songs from Madonna, David Bowie, Diana Ross, Sister Sledge, Duran Duran, Daft Punk, and Beyonce. He is a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, Songwriters Hall of Fame inductee, and a recipient of the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. His music has sold more than 500 million albums and 100 million singles. He's a philanthropist, and most importantly, he is a good human being. Mr. Nile Rogers, welcome. Thank you. Thank I, you, Allison. I mean, when you hear all of these accolades, it's just like... <laughs> 
<laughs> and then, by the way, that's a fraction of all of your accolades. I just I like know. it's running out of breath, I so it's I like true. it's pretty amazing. I feel like your name warrants a prefix, like Sir, you know, like <laughs> Captain of Cool, like something, because you're just so one of one, so unique, Niall. Thank you. That's yeah. really kind of you. Oh. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it, it's such a strange life because I never ever ever imagined. Well, no, I, I'll take that back. I have an incredible imagination, mm. but. Um, the things that I imagine, I never knew that they would come true. The actual things that I really believed would come true was that I'd be sitting second chair in an orchestra somewhere um, uh, because I started out. I started out studying classical music, um, and I was a flute player and then a clarinet player, um, and I thought that that would be a nice job, you know, sitting there. You know playing Prokofiev and Tchaikovsky mm -hmm. and Bach and Lobos and, you know, and it was like, yeah, it was cool. Um, but then, you know, the 60s came along and I always used to make a joke, like, how could we walk down the street doing protest music and I'm playing the clarinet? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't as effective as some it other options. It was like, you know, everybody's right. going, the war is over. <laughs> <laughs> I also play the clarinet, but probably not as All adept right. as you. But yeah, I hear that though. It's so like, I was like going, it doesn't quite work. Yeah. And I picked up a guitar at 16 years old. And 17 years old, I was gigging with Sesame Street. That's I learned the guitar in less than a year and a half because I could already read music. And what's incredible is that when you have uh, those type of fundamentals and you start guitar as opposed to most guitar players who go, oh, can you show me, can you show me a C chord? Can you show me a G chord? Right. Can you show me a F chord? Oh, wow, F is so hard because I got to bar everything. I looked at guitar music and went, this is exact rich in, written range as the B flat clarinet, which is what I'm already good on. I'm just going to take that and trans, like, I'm going to take my etudes and play them on guitar. And I figured out how to do it. Next thing you know, I'm playing, you know, Bach and Beethoven on the guitar. That's unbelievable. But music's in your blood. I mean, your your father was was a, was a renowned musician, and you had such an interesting, unconventional childhood. <laughs> I mean, is that is an understatement? To say the least. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible, and I'd love to hear more about it. Just like how you were raised with two father figures, such a young mother, and it, it's a challenging for a child. How did you sort of? I bet you had created who you are, though, having that unique experience. I, first of all, I had five father figures. Yeah. Uh, I, in, in my memoir, I call it a um, uh, variation on a Mormon theme. Instead of having the, the one mm -hmm. guy with all the wives, they have the one woman with all the husbands. Um, all of my brothers are half-brothers, and all of their fathers were the nicest guys Aww. in the world. My mom attracted these wonderful, beatnik, artistic, fashionistic fashionistic people mm. that were just, I mean, the epitome of cool. Oh. I mean, cool, cool, cool. Well. Yesterday, when I was talking to uh, Mark Ronson, um, his partner, uh, Andrew, that they did Barbie with, he, uh, Andrew said, yeah, you know, I grew up with Thelonious. I'm sorry, I'm going into my beatnik thing. I he love said, it. He said, yeah, I grew up with Thelonious Monk, and I went, you won't believe this. One of my childhood etudes, Monk came and wrote down, why don't you try and play it like this? And I said, I still have that to this day. Oh, Monk's handwritten chart God. of my simple, whatever it was, I think it was Good King Wenceslas or something. And he like freaked it out. At the time, did you recognize like how insane this is? No, because Thelonious Monk was just my mother's friend. <laughs> 
And, no big deal. And I knew that they were cool. <laughs> Nina Simone, I knew she was cool. Gloria Lynn, I knew she was cool. All of these people, I knew they were cool. Eartha Kitt was cool. Oh. James Dean was cool. Wow. But I didn't know they were that cool. I just thought that my parents are cool. Are they cooler than my parents? I don't know. Aww. But um, it, was, it was amazing to grow up in such a bohemian type of household and have parents that loved you in such a way that they treated you like an adult. Mm. And you know, now when I, when I hear parents flipping out like, or people arresting mothers because their children were taking the subway at nine years old. I'm going, I flew across America at seven years old. Right. My parents, they trusted me. They never, ever told me, come in when the street lights come on. My parents knew that I wasn't a bad kid. I came home when there was nothing to do. Yeah. Street lights had nothing to do with anything. It was just like um, street lights would come on and there were some remedial um, programs going on in my neighborhood because I grew up in Greenwich Village in the Lower East Side that uh, these programs basically existed to help European immigrants assimilate into American society. So part of that assimilation was learning English and music and stuff. I learned English. The first book I ever read was Treasure Island. Second book I ever read was Moby Dick. Which you have read many times since then, haven't <laughs> yeah. you? Yeah, and still can't comprehend. I know, it's unbelievable. <laughs> At what point though, because you were so uniquely positioned in these unbelievable experiences and having these icons as just like your regular family friends, that you were like, I want to do music. I want to make music my life. From the first time I became self-aware, I, uh, I was probably about four and a half, five years old. And um, there were these intimidating looking kids sitting across the street from my house on the stoop of a synagogue. And they were all dressed like the Lone Ranger. And the, the mask scared me. Wow. And I thought that just by walking down the street, um, it was an adventure. Like I had to uh, somehow avoid the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Now, I think these kids were probably nice kids, but to visually, they looked scary. Yeah. And, um, and in a strange way, that was the story of a certain part of my childhood because by living on the Lower East Side and then moving to the West Village and being that close to Little Italy and, and you know, and the Italians always had a problem with black kids. And I was like, there was only two black kids in the neighborhood. So they had a problem with us two guys. Okay. And they were always chasing us. But for some crazy reason, even though I was an asthmatic, I had very, very fast twitch muscles and could outrun everybody as a little kid, which is interesting because I look at Olympic athletes and they're men. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, how come men couldn't catch me? Yeah. Um, so um, it was running this weird gauntlet through my own loving, cool neighborhood of hip people. But when they would just see me as a little kid running from white kids, they thought something bad had happened. Like I, and in fact, I've never stolen anything in my life. I don't steal. I don't hurt people. My parents socialized me to care about people. So those thoughts never even came into my mind. The concept of bullyism, and that was like weird. I mean, bullies would attack me. I would never, you know, attack anyone else. So it, it was just a strange. That was a strange period. It didn't last that long, but it was long enough for me to think of music as my savior wow. because I would score the running home. I would go like, and because I was obsessed with swashbucklers like Treasure Island and stuff, so everything was sort of based on 6-8 and, you know, riding the sea. So it was 
so cinematic. Wow. And I just, I lived like that. I'd run down the street. The problem was the byproduct of living that life in my head. My mom would say, hey, what'd you do today at school? Well, mom, I fought off a few pirates. <laughs> right. Wow. So that musical genius was just innate from you from a, from a little boy. Yeah, it was That's there. unbelievable. What is your secret to this youth? You have this fountain of youth. What is it for you? I just, I, damn, I love playing. And there's something about making a person who hired me happy oh. that I can't get over. Um, when I did uh, Random Access Memories and mm -hmm. Daft Punk came to my house and to them it was this big thing, oh, we're coming to the house to play demos and blah, blah, blah. I said, demos? I don't need to hear a demo. <laughs> I don't want to hear a demo. I want to perform for you when I get to the studio because oh. that's how I grew up all my life. I perform for the person who wrote the music or perform for the person who's hired me in the studio wow. to make them happy. When you work for Brian Ferry, it is the most, in it's like so incredible to watch Brian go from this to this. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And it's does, like, it, does it require words? It's Just like, like it's like the I'm feel. there, I'm, I'm in there. the pocket. That's I'm incredible. In the pocket. With Bernard, at what point did you realize that the two of you had this chemistry and like what was happening around you? I know that you had seen Roxy Music and that was, yeah. and then you, you saw Kiss and like seeing yes. all these different artists kind of got you into a headspace where you wanted to go with Bernard, is that yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, Bernard and I, the very first day we met, we were inseparable. That's awesome. And it was incredible because we were on a pickup gig so nobody knew anyone and the guy who had gotten the gig was making the most money. So the way that he could ensure that he'd make more money was to just get unknown guys. And he was like a star. So he figured we'd figure it out. The great thing about Bernard and I, we were so responsible that we just sort of took over the band of these strangers. And in those days, and I'm sort of embarrassed now because you would think that at this age I would be sharp as a tack and blah, 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 but I haven't had to play anyone else's music for 40 something years. So when I was a kid, I had to play everyone else's music. Yeah. Now all I do is play my music. So Bernard and I were calling out the songs by the numbers. We didn't have to tell them the chord changes. We just say, you know, two, flat six, five, four. So and so, and all the musicians were schooled and they knew, and we were able to keep a tight band so that the guy who was the star was able to put on a show. And I remember the very first meeting Bernard and I had, at the end of the night, he said, man, I never want to do a gig without you. Oh, and I, no, and I oh. said to him, I said to him, and I don't know which one of us said it first, oh. Uh, because I've told the story so many Aww. gazillions of times, but I said, I was thinking the exact, exact same, same thing, thing about you or vice versa. Well, see, that's a gift. That's a beautiful, beautiful chemistry. And of course, when Chic, your, for your debut songs, you know, were hit. I mean, it's crazy. You had instant success because you guys had done the work, you had done the work, and then you had this chemistry together. But I love this infamous story about you'd already had, you know, you'd already made your mark with, with Chic and Grace Jones invited you to Studio 54. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is the most historic moment. I mean, please, I, I just would love to hear it from you. So, it's just... so imagine we're, we're kids and we heard all of these stories about rock stars and, you know, and checking in the hotels and under the name of this and remove these color M&Ms from this. And yeah. so we thought that people who were famous had these wacky proclivities that in order for us to hang out with them, we had to understand yeah. that that was a prerequisite to just sitting in the room. So we get this mysterious phone call from Grace Jones and we're like, whoa, wow. Grace Jones <laughs> is calling us? Yeah. 
because all we had at that time was everybody dance, 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 and we did a record for our first lead singer uh, called I Just Can't Wait Till Saturday. And even though these songs don't seem like they were big now, whoa, go back to the underground mm -hmm. in those days. If you see this movie by Spike Lee called The Summer of Sam, he oh, nailed yes. it. Oh, he yes. He nailed it. Everybody mm -hmm. dance was the jam. Awesome. So Grace Jones being the um, visionary that she is, um, said, you know, I think I might want these guys to produce what would have been then her next album. So she calls us up and she just says very matter-of-factly and quickly, so what you do, darling, is I want you to come. <laughs> this is how it sounded to us. Right, right. So please forgive me because <laughs> she doesn't really speak like this, but we never heard her before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's old school telephones and blah, blah, blah. So she says, so this is what you do, darlings. You come to the back door of Studio 54 and you tell them that you're personal friends of Miss Grace Jones. So to us, it sounded like Bella Lugosi <laughs> and like a cross between Bella Lugosi, Marlena Dietrich, and yeah. like Bob Marley, oh right? Because she it's throws yeah. the little Jamaican thing mm -hmm. in. So we thought that this was our rock and roll test. Yeah. That we got to get this right or else they're going to go, get out of here. <laughs> you know. We knock on the back door. We finally get their attention. We're kicking because we got to be louder than the music and inside. The music, right. So finally the dude opens the door and says, what the hell do you want? And we say, ah. We are personal friends of Miss Grace Jones. Oh and she told God. us to come to the back door. And the guys... You thought you had to do your own accent here. Well, we, you were we doing... didn't know. Right, right, we right. honestly didn't did know. not know. Completely innocent. But let me throw this in. Grace, I'm wearing the flyest clothing you can imagine. I'm of wearing, I'm wearing Maud Frazon shoes that cost, I don't know, in those days maybe $700 wow. or and they're suede, black suede with blue piping. I have no and doubt. And it's killing, and this gray suit. Yeah. Boom, bam. Grace Jones, we're uh, going to... Always fire. So we get yeah. there, and it's snowing, so there's salt on the ground. Oh, and no. my suede shoes have a... The ring. In, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you'll see this white it's line. It's the worst. So anyway, when the guy opens the door, and we tell him, we're personal friends of Miss Jones. And he goes, oh, fuck off. <laughs> And we went, no, 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 gang, 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 no, we're dead serious. No, no, we kick it and kick it and kick it. And he opens the door again and says, didn't I tell you to fuck off? And we like realized that we're not going to get in the studio that night. And we were like sort of heartbroken, but on the way to my apartment, which was only one block away. Oh, amazing. We passed a liquor store and bought two bottles of Dom Perignon, which we used to call rock and roll mouthwash. That's the best, rock and roll mouthwash. That's we, incredible. We, Let's still call it that. I still want to call oh, it that. Oh, really? Yeah, we yeah, yeah. we downed them real quick, and you, we got all fuzzy, and we went home, picked up our instruments, and went, oh, fuck off, dude. Don't fuck Studio 54. Fuck off, dude. Don't fuck off. And then we wrote a whole song, a really long song, with the most appropriate answer would be, fuck off. You know, like if your mom asked you to yes. do the homework. Oh. Fuck off. If you anthem. It was 100%. great. 100%. And then so Bernard looked at me and said, uh, my man, you know this shit is happening. Two years before hip hop. Dude, we're not going to be able to get this on the radio. So my parents would beat Nick's. Made me a hippie because I had to try and outdo them. Mm -hmm. uh, so... When Bernard said this is happening, I went into total hippie mode just like that. I wasn't even thinking. And because we had changed the song from fuck off to freak off, which was a euphemism in those days, right. probably still is, for the F U C K word. And he went, oh, So let's do aw, freak off. And I was like, going, Oh man, you know, like, how about man when you like freak out, man? You like, you drop <laughs> acid. Out. Freaked and like, out. you know, you have a bad trip, man. And you know, like, you, you're freaking out. And Bernard looked at me and went, what the? Who is this dude? And I'm like, yeah, man, you know, so like, you know, like, 
And then, you know, like I had a couple of bad trips, man. So, you know, like, probably like freak out. That's it. And he went freak out. And I went, oh, oh, yeah, 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 man. You know, like when you see a really fine girl and you're on the dance floor and you're freaking out. Freaking and you're out. Like, oh. And then Bernard, the genius, the genius that he was went, and my kids are doing this new dance called the freak. Oh, Light my bulb. God. So, so it was getting denied access to Studio 54 and your hippie roots right. that brought up Freak Out. And Bernard's kids and Bernard, doing right. his new dance called The, the Freak. Freak. Oh, so my God. we ran out to the record store and said, OK, let's get the two most iconic songs about a dance. We run out to the store. We buy Chubby Checker, Let's Do the Twist. Yeah. And we buy uh, Joey D and the Starlighters, The Peppermint Twist. We play both records. And the thing that both records have in common, other than the word twist, was they don't show you how to do the dance. Right, right. We didn't know how to do the freak. They didn't obviously know how to do the twist or whatever. And we write, you know, Chubby Checker goes, come on, baby, let's do the twist. Come on, baby, let's do the twist. Take me by my little hand and go like this. Then he doesn't show you how to right. do the twist. He just goes, e ah, let's twist. It's open to know, interpretation. Yeah, and yeah. we listen to Joey D and the Starlight is, well, the name of this dance is the Peppermint Twist. Ba, 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 ba. Well, the name. Uh, you uh, sort of create what it is. Right. And you and listen they, to it. It's like well, however you feel it. Right, but the point is, is that yeah. when they get to the point where they think, where, where the listener thinks they're going to show you how to do the peppermint twist, they're yeah. going to go, well, put your hand here. Then do the, they go, well, all right, all right, the peppermint yeah. twist. Ba, 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 ba. We're like, what the? F yeah. They don't show you how to do the peppermint twist. So we write this song because we don't know how to do the freak. And we go, have you heard about the new dance craze? Listen to us. I'm sure you'll be amazed. Big fun to be had by everyone. It's up to you, surely can be done. Young and old are doing it, I'm told. Just one try, and you too will be sold. It's called the freak. They're doing it night and day. Allow us, we'll show you the way. And of course, we don't show you the way. We just go, <laughs> we just go. But we don't know we show how to. show you nothing. We don't, show you we nothing. don't know how to do the yeah. way. We just go, aw, freak, freak out. out. <laughs> That's so good, Niall. Oh, my God. And that was the song that really changed everything, right? That was like a whole other stratosphere. Yeah, it's wow. still to this very to this day, day the biggest selling song in Atlantic Records history. history. That I, oh. But it's like, okay, like that would have been enough, but then we had good times, you know? And yeah. it's like the story that I know, and you'll tell me, was Chic Blondie and The Clash were playing together yes. in September of 79, and, and you were playing Good Times, and who jumped on stage with you? So here's what the, <laughs> so it, it's funny how people get history twisted. Right, it's like here's telephone. It really yeah, I want to hear it from you. So yeah. Chris and Debbie were like my best friends. The author uh, of uh, the style section in GQ magazine had a television show and we used to go down to the television show and piss people off. It was called TV Party. That's okay. why she goes, just have your party on TV. Oh, okay. Dun, 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 See, dun, I love dun. knowing the stories yeah, behind so these lyrics. TV yeah. Party was a really big underground television show by Glenn O'Brien. So anyway, we're all best of friends. And now they do Rapture, of course, yes. in the tone of La Freak. Yes. Because... It's got to be, you know, you listen to Rapture and you hear Chris Stein go, that's like good time. Of course. So anyway, so we do the gig, blah, blah, blah. Everything is over. But in those days, there really were no rules. Like, yeah, so what? You're supposed to stop. You're supposed to close a club in New York at four. Did anyone care? No. No. Right. Like, let us let them bust us. So. The show is over, Clash play, Blondie plays, Chic plays. We weren't headlining, so I made it sound like it was that order. <laughs> but whatever order it was in, whatever order it was in. It's a dream lineup. That's a dream lineup. Right. We yeah. all played, and it was great. We're all the best of friends. Um, my girlfriend used to go out with one of the guys in the club. We were all, we were all tight. So now we decide, okay, let's get on stage and play a mixture of rapture and good time. Okay. So we get on stage and we just start playing. 
So Fab Five Freddy jumps up on stage, Futura 2000, and all these B-boys, we just see this herd of B-boys come up on stage. Now, I saw recently that the Sugar Hill Gang said they came up on stage. I don't think so. Because everybody that came up on stage were all people we knew. Okay. We didn't physically know the Sugar Hill Gang yet. Got they, it. They, they, they weren't in our orbit. Um, we knew about them because we knew Rap Rapper's Delight and we had a lawsuit and all that. Mm -hmm. But it was all the downtown people and all the B boys from New York and, and you know, in the South Bronx. And we just get up and we just jam. And it was like so magical to hear that kind of improv and freestyle and I'll never forget this like probably to the day I die I remember and honestly this is not to be offensive because this is just freestyling yeah um but I remember Fab Five Freddy said, uh, see the girl in the red with the scarf around her head see the girl in the yellow got a fact for a fellow and it was like so dope. Yeah. I was like, ah, this is crazy. It was awesome. That moment was history. It was that amazing. That moment of that fusion. I mean, that's the epitome of rock and roll. It right, was like but, all these different. But that's what was great about it because what, what, what Fab Five was saying was that in this environment, we're all brothers and sisters. Yeah. We are all down. There's a girl dancing with a guy who's queer and there's a girl in the red got a scarf around her head see the girl in yeah. the yellow got a faggot I'm ball chills fella. i'm chills yeah it's amazing yeah to, for me my life never was the same again because that was the year that the whole disco sucks thing came out mm -hmm. And I never thought Chic was a disco band. Buy a damn Chic album. We're an album band. Yeah. And yeah, we had two fast songs, but the rest of the album were ballads and instrumentals and jazz. And, you know, so we couldn't understand how, you know, everybody like hated us. And what was funny is they pitted us against the knack. <laughs> the most ridiculous thing in the world. We're working in the same studio together. Sharona. My Sharona. Like, yeah. Sharona, we go out to lunch. We yeah. go out to lunch with Sharona. I'm like, what do you That's mean? That's so crazy. Like the knack and chic hate each other. We're both vying for the number Aww. one spot. But we're like buddies. Yeah. Like, but the press was like, the knack, or they're going to be the saviors of rock and roll. The knack this, the knack that, the knack this. Great song. Yeah. Oh, it has. It's so good. It's so good. Great good. song. Yeah. Song. But... One year later, right. there were no songs that went to song. them. Right. One year later, every song went, this is Radio Clash, or boom, 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 another one bites the, the dust. dust. Yes. Or, you know exactly. what I mean? It was like, or, or bounce, doom, doom, rock. I, I mean, to shape. know that that song really was the blueprint, well, one, it Rappers of Light brought hip hop to the masses, you know, right. it was literally, Mainstream. it was, it, that was it. it. That yeah. was it. So, I mean, again, if that had been it, that would have been enough. But then you continued. But what was so interesting with the demise of disco, I can imagine that must have been a, a difficult time. It's horrible. For yeah. But yeah. what was great is that we had already signed our deal with Diana Ross, because I promise you, uh, Barry Gordy would have uh, not hired us. But we had already signed the deal, so he had to go through with it. And this wonderful woman, Suzanne DePass, was fighting like crazy for us. And she said, please trust these young guys. They know what they're doing. They understand the club scene. But here's what people didn't really understand. It wasn't that we understood the club scene. We understood artists. Artists, yes. It wasn't the I, there, scene. It was no, about the individual. Yeah, there's no record that sounds like good times. Yeah. There's no record that sounds like we are family. No. There's no record that sounds like let's I'm, dance. I'm There's no record out. that sounds yeah. like I'm coming. No. I'm coming out is completely unique. Let's dance is completely unique. I never tried to copy anything that I did before. Does get lucky sound like 
Any, anything. anything. No, no. And that is the magic of Nile Rodgers. And I think that's what's so special about you is that you are this musical chameleon, you know? It's like you bring this sort of arsenal of musicality, but you also bring the heart. So you're able to get in the room with an artist and just be a catalyst for them. It's pretty special. I mean, you've, you've done some of the, I mean, you know, Daft Punk and Pharrell, Get Lucky, it's a great example. I think that is your most streamed song now. Yeah. It has yeah, over yeah, a billion. A billion, over yeah. a billion, yeah. Isn't yeah. that wild? Like, it's crazy because um, I don't really see myself like that or my career like that. It's always just sort of after the fact. Um, at the time I'm doing a record, I'm just trying to, and I've said this a million times, all I'm doing is joining your band. Oh. You know, when I, when I first met Madonna, she was opening up for an artist that I actually was going to work with. But the opening act impressed me so much. I went backstage to talk to Madonna, and I knew she was Jelly Bean's girlfriend at the time, and I was like, going, oh, JB is my man. His mom owns the the supermarket in my neighborhood in the Bronx where my mom shops and and she and I connected so much and just to show you how cool to me this is really the heart of a person forget the facade that they try and put on because rock and roll people always do this and it makes me what was the last book you read oh war and peace but I the new version that's in German, like, oh, dude, mm -hmm. you read fucking People magazine. Yeah, or like something. putting on airs. Please yeah. give me a break. Right. But, but, you know, when I met Madonna, this was early on in her career, and she was just brilliant and intelligent, and came to New York to work with Alvin Ailey and cool, yeah. and was with Jean Michel Basquiat. I mean, she was cool, but she was humble. She knew that as a musician, I knew more about the technical mm -hmm. um, structure of music. And she just said, it's your record. I, you know, last year she and I had a party and I never knew that the Like a Virgin album is the only album that has one producer on it. Me. Wow. Every other Madonna record has more than Multiple. one producer. Multiple, yeah. It's the only record that has one producer. Wow. And, and when she said that, she was like, oh, we should do another record again. But I, I was like completely shocked because, I mean, I know Pat Leonard and I know the genius of all the other people she's worked with, um, but I never realized that my record is the only record that she just sort of handed over to one person. It's amazing. And said, do this record. And it's we did it. It's a testament to you, yeah. Yeah, we did it so fast. And the love, the love between us, look at the credits on the album. Yeah. I mean, that's sheep talking. And, and I see a lot of rock and roll critics say, um, um, Like a Virgin is the last great chic album. Because it's basically, I talked her into letting my band mm -hmm. be the band instead of having it all electronic. And yeah. I just said, you know, Mo, like, if we just did another electronic record, you would be anybody. Like, there's like a million girls that mm -hmm. can do that. But if Chic plays, it's only going to sound like Chic. If Earth, Wind, and Fire plays, right. it's only going to sound like Earth, Wind, and Fire. If the Gap Band plays, it sounds like the Gap Band. Yeah. If Blondie plays, it's going to sound like Blondie. Do you think you and Madonna would collaborate again? We really, really like each other. And when I saw her kids at this party, Aww. wow, did I fall in love with her son. Aww. He walked out. He came up to me. We were roller skating. He said, shit, I want to dress like you. <laughs> He's 16 years old. I mean, that, who does At it? the time, he yeah. was 16 years old. He's yeah. like, well, I want to dress like you. And he looked totally cool. So it was like, and they, they were like so well-mannered and great. And I'm like going, wow, Madonna's like my mom to her Aww. kids. She's like, let them be who they are. Let them be free spirits. Aww, that's so special. She's awesome, man. I don't, so you're you know, saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, 
you know, look, when you when you get older, um, the the thing about me, and I can't speak for Mo, I can't speak for Madonna. Um, uh, when when you're like me, all I care about is the same thing I cared about when I was 17. I told somebody the other day, um, he asked me, how come I still carry my Strat on my back everywhere I go? And I said, because my guitar is a work. Oh, yesterday was the 70th anniversary of the Stratocaster. So yes. we did a whole big filming. And somebody says, is that the Strat? And I went, of course. <sighs> and they said, do you still carry it on your back every day? And I said, yeah. And they said, why? I said, because I used to wake up every morning, look at my daily planner and go, I'm at this studio at 12, at this studio at 3.30, this studio at 7, this studio at so-and-so. I still believe I'm that guy, yeah. even though it's a little bit more organized. But yesterday, I was at this studio, did a music video at this studio, did another music mm -hmm. video. That's how my life is. And my workhorse is my mate. It's on my back. It's your grounding force. It really I'm is. I'm not going to get there. I don't have anybody carrying my stuff. I'm, yeah. yeah. It's, it's my That's guitar. what's so special about you. We have to, have to, have to talk about Bowie Let's Dance. Because it's literally, and I, I have a picture, but Let's Dance is the number one most song played in my household. And my family is obsessed with it. And please look at my son, Cole. His middle name is Hendrix. And he requested David Bowie. And this is what he was yeah, for Halloween. Insane. We literally listen to Let's Dance. When I say every day, I mean like all day. So right. It's the soundtrack of my household. So I wanted to personally thank you for this song and for your work with David because you know, I mean, you said it, David was like a Picasso of, of right. rock and roll. He hated that when I said that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I was just like, well, you gotta hate it, but dude, that's yeah, how I see like, it. You can't tell me what I see the world like. I don't tell you what you see the world like. What was, I mean, what was me. it like, the two of you together, I, I feel like the, the world should have imploded, but I mean, created one of the greatest songs ever. But what was that? See, see, here's what's complicated about David. So he and I, we meet at an after hours club. And it was like the opening night. And if not the opening, certainly the second week or something. And it was owned by a friend of mine, Arthur, who was one of the nightlife empresarios. So we go to this joint, the Continental, and I walk in. Now, I found, I've since found out that I was actually driving there, uh, and I drove this, uh, this mix engineer named Jimmy Douglas to the gig, but then I saw Billy, and Billy and I used to hang out like every night. So when I saw Billy, it was only natural that the, you know, I mean, people, in those days, nobody had a car in New York, yeah, let no. alone a no. Maserati. Right. And I like, parked my Maserati in front, and the clubs like to have it out in front. So I parked my car, I see Billy, um, and who was his girlfriend, Perry, I see Billy and Perry there, and so Billy and I, we just start laughing and joking. We walk inside together, and we happen to notice David sitting all by himself at a little bar in the back, and he's sipping orange juice. Now, remember, this is the, this is the beginning of the 80s, so the club kid thing is like the bomb. Yeah. Bowie would totally fit into the club kid thing, like put on the conic hat, the conical hat, and yeah. blah, 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 be... You know, be yeah. strange. So to me, I thought that's what Bowie lived like. <laughs> right. He's sipping orange juice by himself right. in a bar He's instead. sipping orange yeah. juice by himself, and he's dressed in a suit. And wow. I'm like going, dude, we're all got spiky hair, yeah. and we're like purple and Wild, green. yeah. Yeah, because crazy color had just come in, so everybody's like wacky. And, and Billy goes, bloody hell. Once again, sorry, don't mean to do accents, but this is You do like, a pretty good job. Sounds like to yeah. my ears. Yeah. He goes, no, bloody hell, it's David fucking Bowie. And the English say Bowie they say instead Bowie, of Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> and as he said bow, he barfed. Because we, <laughs> we have been getting lit all night. <laughs> Oh he had been God. getting lit without you me. You cannot cue that up better. Oh, my God. No, no, no. I, 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 David I'm, Barfy. I'm going to probably go off camera here, but this, you got, this, is, okay. this is the move. Okay, it's worth it. It's worth Billy it. Billy goes, no, bloody hell, 
that's David fucking Bowie. <laughs> and as he says Bowie, the barf comes like projectile vomit. Puke on the truth. I'm, I'm probably exaggerating no, with I the know, projectile. No, I know, it's amazing, the exact but syllable, still, maybe, yeah. Even if it was just a burp. I know. It was like barf. Oh my God. And, and he goes, that's David fucking Bowie. <laughs> But the yeah. thing is, because I didn't barf, I didn't break a stride. So by the time Billy got over to us, David and I were engrossed in conversation. Um, because as soon as we met, I, I think, um, and this is uh, an ex-drug addict's memory. Okay. Yeah. But I think the first words out of my mouth were, dude, you live in the same building as my best friends. Luther Vandross, no. Carlos Alomar, all the young Americans. You guys all live in the same building. Like, wow, this is so cool to meet you. And he went, hey, man, now Rogers, I know all about you. And you know that we never, ever, ever talked about rock and roll that night. Oh. We only talked about jazz. Wow. And J David was a jazz aficionado. And then I think we got into a whole thing of trying to one-up each other. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive, mm -hmm. but I felt the competition. Oh. It was like... Oh man, have you heard that new Albert Eiler record? Albert Eiler? Shit, man. Have you heard Sun Ross new jam? And we went all You're like, oh and yeah. Got, yeah. And we got deeper and deeper and deeper into the, the most avant garde. And we're like, you know, it was wow, crazy. That's magic. Yeah. So he sl I slipped in my phone number. I don't remember doing this, by the way, but I slipped in my phone number and. Um, uh, he called my house, which was under renovation, and I had mob guys working on my house because my next door neighbor was, hey, no, nah, the fucking breed concrete. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the fuck, fucking cocksuckers, I breed concrete. You know? So he's building my house. He's, you know, he's fixing, putting in a swimming pool and the whole bit. And he says, yeah, some dude keeps calling every day and he's saying he's David Bowie. You know? Like, I don't oh. know what to say. So I keep hanging up the phone and say, hey, don't call here again. He keeps hanging and, up on David right. Bowie. So I said, mm. I said oh, oh, that that's is David literally Bowie. literally David Bowie. The next time that dude calls, give me the phone. Oh, my God. And so, so David was getting frustrated, and he called Bernard. Somehow he got Bernard's number. You know, we're in the yeah. business, and you can figure out how to get someone's phone number. He calls Bernard's house and says, I keep calling Niall's house. He gave me the number. And his people are hanging up on me. And and Bernard calls me. And Bernard, now Bernard and I are on the skids, right? Because I leave the band. Yeah. So we're yeah. on the skids, and he makes a very short conversation. Uh, hey, my man, um, you know, David is looking for you. David who? David Bowie, man. He's uh, looking for you. So please answer the phone the next time he calls. Click. <laughs> oh, well, at least he, he, you know, he did a solid by giving you the heads Trust up. Trust me, Bernard and I loved each other till the day oh. he died. But, it, you know, it's rock and roll. It Come is on. rock and roll. It's, we're, who, we're, were we any different than any other band where, oh. like, Crosby stills in yeah, Nash no, it's, or it's the rock Eagles or, you know, totally. like, or whatever. So anyway... Uh, but you love, there's the love-hate thing going on. Mm -hmm. So now David calls, and we talk, and we decide that we're going to now meet um, at uh, this very fancy restaurant. And so I walk in dressing like Nile Rogers would walk into a yeah. very dignified, mm -hmm. fancy restaurant. But he only saw me as the Nile Rogers as the club kid. Okay. And I only saw him as the Bowie. This was like a first date in a way. Yeah. I feel like this I, was. Yeah, yeah, I only saw Bowie as the super metrosexual mm -hmm. Bowie, which he was now bringing in this movement, but he was ahead of us. Yes. We didn't know. So I had told my girlfriend at the time that I'm going to meet David Bowie. So she calls all her girlfriends, and they're sitting in the restaurant waiting to see Bowie, and they think that this is some kind of wacky rock and roll ritual that both he and I sit at the bar and don't talk to each other. Because I'm trying to look around and see who looks like both. Right, right, He's looking right. around. And, You're both trying to play cool, but like, like you actually nice. don't recognize each other. Right, right. we totally don't. <laughs> and, and this is what gave me more respect for Bowie than any music or anything in the world. And I hope you understand this. The fact that Bowie saw a black man at Bemelman's Bar 
and didn't automatically believe it had to be Nile Rodgers. He just believed that it was just some other black man well-dressed at Bemelman's Bar. It, it wouldn't have been racist for him to assume that it was Nile Rodgers. There are no other black guys here. There's one guy who I invited. It must be Nile right. Rodgers. Right. He didn't think that at all. He thought there was this very well-dressed, debonair black man at, the, at Bemelman's because that's what you would be yeah. at Bemelman's. Yeah. And I go outside and I call his office and I said, when the hell is Bowie going to get here? And they said, he's been there for a half hour. So I go back inside and I look at the only dude who sort of is Bowie S. Yeah. And I talk to him and then he and I start Were you cracking, cracking up. up I bet. Meanwhile, my girlfriend and her crew are crying. Like, oh, what? that is the best story, Niall. <laughs> it's a, it's a, that's the best first date ever. <laughs> You know, your accomplishment after accomplishment, you know, of course, your song Cup with Beyonce last year, multiple Grammys, I mean, the list goes on and on. What are you most proud of? Is there a, a, a is it an accomplishment? Is it a, is it a legacy? It's e everything. I, I'm proud of the flops as well as the hits. Um, one of the greatest records I've ever made was Al Jarreau. Um, it, it's mega. And the fact that we, like idiots, gave Moonlighting <laughs> to Irving Azov, he gets a number one with it. It's not on our album, because Al Jarreau is now obsessed. He says, now, I want to show the world that you're a jazzer. So we kick Moonlighting off our record. Irving Azov gets a damn number one, and we're like, somewhere near the bottom of the charts because we have all this cool jazz, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's great. But, um, you know, timing is everything with the charts. And, um, but I, I have a gazillion records like that. I mean, you know, Rick Okasik, Fireballs, wow. David Lee Roth, man, the, you know, I'm in L.A. now and I can't ride on the 101 without going... I'm on the one oh one down 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 but I bought myself a gun in case some babe tried to rape her. I mean like that. And he's gonna boom down down tick 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 down tick down down You can literally do any I mean you can collect is there anyone you wish you you would like to work with that you haven't yet worked with? Yeah, it was Miles Davis because he and I did a fashion shoot for Ise Miyake and um and uh, at the end of the shoot, uh, Miyake gave me this coat that he realized was way too expensive, even at Miyake's prices, to put in, you know, in, in, into circulation. So he gave me the coat. And the first few incidents with Miles was him calling me up going, damn, man. Uh, yo, now nah, can you give me that coat, man? You know, I, I need that coat. Because I don't know what Issei gave him, but it was right. not, that, it was not coat. that coat. That coat was just a one of a kind. I still have it. Oh. Only one in the world that exists. Oh. And, um, and then so Miles and I became friends because, check this out, I, my, my girlfriend was married the entire time she and I were going together. Then she got a divorce. Um, I bought Norma Kamali's apartment at 2 East 80th Street. And that was where Barbara Hutton was born. Very famous heiress during the Gilded Age and all that kind of stuff. So she, fabulous house. And Miles lived on uh, 79th Street, right, where you go in the Central Park. So his window looked into our oh. terrarium type of thing. Mm -hmm. So Miles, uh, we, we developed a friendship for a few months and he would tell me to call him, you know, after a certain time, because he was married. Yeah. Uh, and he'd be like, you know, nah, can you call me after like 7 o'clock? Can we go out and do our thing? So we'd go out, and I had known of Miles' reputation of sort of berating people, and, but God, he was a sweetheart with me. He mm. never once acted weird. We, were, we just had so much fun. Because it was strange, now Miles was on my turf, right? Yeah. So imagine we're in the 80s, 
and it's no longer about going to the jazz club. Right. It's going to Niles Club. Yeah. It's going to, you know, your world. 54 and Danceteria yeah. and, and, and the underground joints. And at the end of the night, he would eventually say, uh, Niles, I want you to write me a motherfucking good times. And I go, okay, he's setting me up for the man. Yeah. So, you want me to write you good times? You're Miles Davis. You're Bitches Brew and Sketches of Spain and Fiji Kilimanjaro. And what are you talking about? And, and this would happen at least, I, I, we probably went on five or six dates. Of course, in my young mind, I like to believe it was 50. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't that many. But inevitably, every night he asked me for my coat. And <laughs> my coat and good times every single and neither night. one happened of course not you still have the coat and you did and not I, you did because not i was embarrassed Aww. i kept writing i kept writing jazz fusion songs and he would say mm -hmm. well, and i hope you don't mind me using profanity no, i'm please. just giving you yeah no this keeping is it real story. this is he, actually it he was a motherfucker i can write that shit and Marcus Miller was his uh, bass player and I believe his producer at the time. He was saying, motherfucker, I can write that shit. Marcus is gonna write that shit. Um, I want me a motherfucker good time. He wanted you, he wanted you. No, he wanted, he wanted to be on the pop chart. Right, right, but I'm saying he wanted your, you were trying to do something specific for him and his style, but he really wanted you to create like that mega pop hit for him. Right, right. And, yeah. and I only noticed that after I was no longer, I broke up with the girlfriend, so I was no longer on 79th Street. I was back in my apartment on 71st Street on the west side. Mm -hmm. and, and then I noticed Miles Davis putting out albums of pop covers, like Human Nature right, and right, stuff right. like that. And I was like, going, oh okay, man. Okay, now I got how it. How could I have misread? Right. Ugh. How could I have misread this guy being sincere and it's pouring true. his heart out to me. Because yeah. you don't think of Miles, at least right. I didn't. Right. You didn't think of Miles like that. You thought of Miles as like, man, get the fuck out of here, man. Yeah. You know, like I heard all the stories about him going to like nightclubs and saying to drummers. Um, so uh, I hear for you, time is just a magazine. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. I mean, you can't even make that up. That's like incredible. Like, what a mildism. <laughs> you are so one of one and just so uniquely positioned. You are a living legend. I mean, what do you hope your legacy is going to be? I truly um, don't know, but I've been giving it some serious thought now because when you reach your 70s, um, and I was a math major, <laughs> uh, you know that uh, time ain't on, on your side. side. No, it ain't. Mm. So um, I like to think of myself as a creator. I'm a songwriter. And I wanted to be, um, I mean, yesterday I worked with, I, I sure hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. But I work with the first um, Arab, is uh, Palestinian, Palestinian, Israeli group, and we got a. It's a smash. It is so good. And when I first started working with them, I said, you know what, this part has got to be like this. And I know the producer was a little upset. And, then I walked onto set yesterday to do the music video, and it was my way. Mm. And everybody was slapping me by. I said, he went for it. <laughs> I said, because it was dope. It was so much cooler than the way you had yeah. it. Yeah, you um, got to trust. You got to trust. Well, but that's what I do. I'm yeah. a composer. I'm a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like if I can't help your song, you don't need me. You just hire somebody. If you just want somebody to play guitar, just mm -hmm. hire that person because they're people who are a lot better guitar players than me, so just hire them. But if you Unless want you're magic, you're magic. Yeah, well, if you yeah. want a person who can help the composition, that's, that's who I do. am. That's what I try and be. Yeah. So I would hope that people remember me as a composer, a person 
who makes something from nothing. You have made this world a better place and you continue to do so each day, not only as a composer and musician, but as a good person, um, as a beautiful soul. You're a role model. Thank you, Niall, for oh, everything. What, just, a, what a gift this is to sit with you. You're just nice. You're no, a nice person. <laughs> no, no, I tell it like it is. I'm a New Yorker too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. How amazing is Niall? I'm still on a high just from our conversation and, and being in his presence. He's just such a beautiful, beautiful being. Thank you, Niall Rogers. And thank you for being part of the Allison Hagendorf Show presented by Cloudwater. I would love to hear from you. So please rate, review, like, comment, whatever you're feeling, and reach out to me on socials. I want to connect with you. Thank you to our awesome partners at Danny Wimmer Presents, Sweetgrass Vodka, and Karma Sauce. Thanks again. I'll see you next time. And remember, you're a rock star.